So why am I starting things out on a toilet? Well, because I want to get the unpleasant stuff out of the way first. My tour of Dynetics was absolutely fantastic, something I will never forget. However, even though we had lapel mics and a variety... So here we are, a place that I've wanted to be for so long here at Dynetics in Huntsville, Alabama. And as you can see behind me, this is the low fidelity mock-up for the Alpaca Lander. Everybody likes to talk about how tiny this thing is, but really, I think all of you would agree that Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Gene Cernan, all of them would have loved to have a vehicle this big to land on the moon. And the capabilities of this thing are very impressive. And we're going to find out all about that right now. so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers. Sure. So I'm Jeremy Blaylock. I'm the Design and Integration Lead for the Dynamics Human Landing System. So my role is really to integrate all the vehicles and elements of the Artemis architecture and how it interacts with our architecture. So anything from how we rendezvous to dock the gateway to how we rendezvous to dock the surface habitats eventually, how we deliver habitats, basically how Artemis works. So anything down to like what the electrical connectors are to make sure that we can plug into another vehicle that we approach. Now, quick question for you because I've made lots of comments about some of your competitors that have you know entrance way off the ground versus where you are right now. Even up here on this kind of shaky platform, it still feels kind of intimidating if I were on the moon stepping out for the first time. So, how is an astronaut going to gain access to the rest of this uh, great great question? Great question. So I like to compare it to what we're like climbing out of a treehouse. We're about 2.4 meters now from the lunar surface at a nominal landing condition. We can land on very steep slopes. We have more surface access than I would say any competitor for that. So there's some slides we have where we have you know, some of the slopes we want to land on are extremely steep. NASA has a requirement to land on 10 degrees, um, but we can land on much more than that, opening up much more than lunar surface to exploration. So we can get right up to those crater edges or land, you know, where it's not permanently shadowed because that's protected. But we can get right up to the edges on the hillsides, on the mountainous regions where the good science is. So getting down, we have a ladder or a descent system um, that will be designed to safely basically get us down. It's not far. Uh, we also have a, uh, a wind system for uh, bringing up samples and payloads for a freezer system on the inside for sample return. We also have an incapacity crew system, so if the astronauts run into trouble, they're really from two meters off the surface, they can hook into the safety harness and they can help them into the back of the door with that arm, just like you have on a black box helicopter. So obviously, I'm sure you prefer to talk about your vehicle rather than somebody else's, but let's talk about what Blue Origin was originally proposing, which has 10 meter, a 10-meter ladder coming up here pretty much in order to get access to this big. How are we going to deal with an incapacitated crew member having to be hauled up 10 meters? I mean, can you even think of how that would be done? I can't really speak to what their solution is, and you know they have very good people working on their system. I'm sure they have all the safe, safe, safety critical ideas that we have, and we want to ensure the crew have a safe return. Right? Because they're all friends and family. They're our coworkers, and so we want to make sure they get home safety every time. So our solution gets you down close to the surface for payloads or crew, and eliminates the need for elevators or link systems. And, we want to go with the simplest, most mass efficient solution, whether that's a ladder or some type of rope descender. Just keep it as simple as possible, reliable. You know, dumb mechanical systems don't like complicated electronics when it comes to cruising. Right. Uh, fantastic. Very interesting. All right, let's head on in. Right on. All right, so tell me what we're looking at right here just inside the crew right. hatch. Okay, so this is where the real action right. takes place in the crew hatch. You're standing in the EVA section. And I want to just really speak to the, the fact that say, you hear that our crew module is small. It's like you're standing in it, but you're 6'2", and you have headroom. Yeah. You have room to, to stretch out, 
Now, the real, you know, when we're on the moon, we'll have the two um, XEMU suits for a two crew mission, or four for a four crew mission, right? And we really want to let our system, you know, is we are a transportation system. Like, we are not really set up for a long-term habitability. We are meant to get the crew to and from the surface safely. We can, we can tolerate, um, we're designed for like a seven day mission, but we can tolerate it to a, a 30 day mission, including a lunar night stay. So, um, wow. so it will be, you know, the idea for that stay is that we will have a pressurized rover that the crew can transfer into, a lot roomier uh, for a longer stay, and eventually we'll have habitats. And that's where we get into the area of our docking system. I want to talk about a shirt sleeve transfer and docking. So we have the ability, since we're so close to the lunar surface, to dock to a pressurized rover directly. No EVA is required. Now this is something that never occurred to me. Neither the Blue Origin solution, at least the one they presented thus far, nor Lunar Starship has the ability to hard dock with anything on the lunar surface. Their entrance points are simply too high off the ground. Now of course, Starship could carry a rover, for example, in its cargo bay, but if it does that and you have to lower it down using an elevator, that means that elevator has to be rated for a very heavy vehicle and not just crew. And then in terms of habitats here, space has put out a couple of pictures showing like a, one of their inflatable life modules attached right. to the side of Alpaca. I mean, have you done some thinking in that regard Sierra's as well? Sierra's done some really good work, and they did some testing out at Marshall recently. Um, some good burst videos that I've seen on your site, and um, some friends that work over at Marshall. So Sierra's doing really great stuff, and the, the possibilities afforded by inflatable habitats. I mean, you think about if we set down with our with our payload capacity, if we set down a permanent hab habitation module, whether that's fully integrated, where Alpaca stays now with a fully integrated hab module, and stays on the surface, or we um, leave a hab module on the surface and take back up to NRHO, right? Having inflatable modules that deploy off the ends dramatically increases the habitable volume for a long term, -term surface stay. Fantastic. Tell me more. Okay, so uh, looking around, you see some of the dust barriers. So dust is a huge problem. And uh, really the key here is to not allow dust into the, into the crew module in the first place. So we have a couple technologies that you'll see a little later uh, for removing dust from the suits prior to entry. You know something? I don't want to wait to see that dust mitigating technology. Let's have a look at that first, and then we'll get back to the tour inside the alpaca. All right, so uh, yet another member of the team. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Certainly. My name is Diana Chambers, and I'm a senior principal scientist at Dynetics. So, uh, you know, obviously one of the biggest problems that are going to face us, regardless of whether we're on the moon or Mars, is regolith, the highly charged kind of electrostatic nature of it, and how damaging it can be to equipment. So what do we have here to solve it? We have here an electrodynamic dust machine. And this is technology transferred out of the Kennedy Space Center and built and developed completely here in dynamics. So it's a concept where we have transparent electrodes. And this is specifically in the case of, for example, optical sensors. Very critical for being able to um, guide and, and land precisely and safely. And so we want to make sure they're clear from dust. So that we have a, uh, a clear window with transparent electrodes, and those electrodes are able to clear dust after they've been charged. Okay. Well, so I'm an astronaut, you know, coming in from a, from a you know, few hours of EVA on the moon. I got big feet, I'm clumsy, I scatter dust all over these, this, this, and what happens? How do we, how do we deal with that? So I'm going to ask my team member to come, uh, Nicholas, to come scatter some dust for us. This stuff is very damaging to equipment, electrostatically charged, so it really creates a lot of problems. All right, it, can, it will uh, potentially obscure our view with our cameras and scratch our lenses. It certainly makes it difficult to, uh, to reuse our equipment. And so this is, uh, has been developed, again, specifically for the, the transparent applications. It can be put in other... Uh, conditions as well, or other uses, um, but this is one that's absolutely critical to getting this on the surface and off. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I've heard stories, you know, from Apollo of just how tons and tons of this stuff got into the lander. I mean, what sort of challenges did this represent for them when they were on the lunar surface? Well, it was huge. And they um, had difficulty removing it from their um, radiators, their spacesuits became damaged, they got holes in their spacesuits. In fact, as I understand it, even 
um, they've been canceled in their EDAs. Wow. That bad. Mm -hmm. Let's see what, what this does to the dust. Wow. Uh, that's, that's what everybody said. It looks like magic, but there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into that. Can you imagine how much difference that's going to make in our sensors? It's literally night and day. I, I, that's mind blowing. It, it, it just vanished. It, it didn't even look real the way it happened. Wow. So describe again how that process worked. So there is a, uh, a transparent window, and on that window, our microfabrication department. Um, that develops, so we've uh, come up with a process for indium 10 oxide, which is a, a very thin film material, and they pattern that in interdigitated electrodes. And then we're able to have a two phase system that runs 4,000 volts, plus or minus 2,000, and is able to charge the dust and then basically walk the dust particles off of the system. So this is, has a protecting counter uh, top, top layer on top of the electrodes. And so this, again, all developed in house with our microfabrication department and our electronics design department. And then one of the next questions is, if we have electrodes in front of an optical system, what happens? Right. Does that impact its performance? And so we were able to develop an optical test bed and test this with different types of sensors. Well, as you know, as, as we all know, the littlest things sometimes make the biggest impact. I mean, we always get blown away by big rocket engines and huge takeoffs and such, and yet that was as impressive to me as, as SLS taking off. That's just amazing. Thank you. Um, and in, interior, in the interior system, we have some dust removal procedures and uh, techniques that have proven to be pretty effective. They're removing most of the particulate matter from the, the, uh, the air handler system. We have a uh, very robust air handler system that can fil filter out all the particulate. And uh, you have, you know, four crew in here for a while, you know, there's odors. You know, people right. smell over time. And, you know, you sweat a little less in the microgravity, but, you know, you still have to deal with that. So our filtration system. This uh, looks a little bit different than, uh, than the uh, film, the promotional film that I've seen when people walk around inside here. So, so tell me what we're looking at here, please. Right. So this is the, uh, the operational area and the flight deck area. So this is all config configurable based on what we call phase of flight. So um, consider yourself like in an overland camper, right? So really the key there is being able to reconfigure the vehicle based on the phase of flight. So when you're in a sleeping phase with the crew, you know, things stow out of the way. We can set up the bunks and the crew can sleep for comfortably. And we can also, uh, you know, move the toilet around if we need to. We can move all this equipment around as need to. Oh yeah, space toilet. I just yeah, the space that. toilet. Yeah. Right. So that's uh, <laughs> so that's part of the uh, the lunar loo program that NASA is putting on. There. They did some crowd uh, crowdsource design, and they're um, currently working with the um, I believe with SpaceX right now and some other suppliers. I'm not really sure who, but, but they're working on a more permanent toilet solution. We don't want to use Apollo bags. Right. Right. So, right. But everyone needs to go. Right, so we want to make it as comfortable as possible. Uh -huh. um, so we have hygiene areas that are also in there. So if you have, you know, times you need, you know, hygiene privacy, we have a privacy curtain that can close off and give the crew a bit of privacy. You know, it's tight quarters, but you know, we all have to live together in this time. There's food areas. Um, you know, we have food warmers, and then the water system um, will be uh, over in this area. So this is all foam court. It can all move around. So this is really just a tool. It's not meant to be flashy. It's not meant to be really polished. We move this stuff around like, in, you know, I can pull this right off and so I don't like where this goes. I want to put it over you know, here, right. You know, you've seen that before uh, because it's really just a tool to see where it makes sense because it takes a lot of hours to do stuff in CAD and VR. Uh, whereas we can just come in here with a physical mock-up and move stuff around. If we want to change graphics, we just print out a new page. So you've asked, you've had astronauts in here, yes, absolutely, and, and to check out and, and what sort of feedback do you get from them on how this is configured? I mean, I don't see a lot of like visual, you know, like a lot of a lot of uh, you know a lot of blind spots and that sort. Of, I right. assume you're going to be using the lidar and other ways to land, yeah. aside from the old way of landing Apollo, which is to you know, look out the window. Yeah, and, Apollo had slanted yeah. windows. We we don't. So really, right. you won't see the surface until touchdown. And um, we have a roll maneuver so the crew can verify that yes, I see the landing site visually, 
and they we flip back over and land. So this thing's gonna like that to, to get a good look and get look at yeah, and then and then come. All right, so I was unaware of that. It's, it's a human verification of the sensor data. So we have a scanning lidar system that we can see in complete darkness all the way down to the landing site, and it's all in instrument display. So the crew is looking at the instrument display for the landing. They still have the window for verification. If something doesn't feel right, the human has control, can take over control at any time. We have full abort capability all the way down to the surface. So if something goes wrong, you know, they hit the big red button and they bug out back to Gateway. Okay, so we don't want to just talk about landing on the moon. Let's go ahead and land at Shackleton Crater in this simulator. So what am I going to be flying today? Let's have a look at it. We're actually going to be flying the last bit and a half of landing on the South Pole moon. Got it, kid. No. It's going to be great to see no you. Way. Way. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait. Are you kidding me? A full-fledged simulator? Yeah. I, I wasn't expecting this. This blows my mind. This is our yeah. local model. It's on a motion base. Here, so it'll actually move you around a little bit. And it'll shake you when you land. Uh, you've got a nice big panorama uh, view of the moon out front. So my understanding is once again, I'm gonna land with you guys handling it, yep. and then I'm gonna try to crash. Exactly. All right, Let's see how you do compare. Oof. So, okay. are you familiar with these controls and how they work? Heck no. Okay, <laughs> so this, this should be pretty familiar, right? This is your, your roll. Sure. So left, right, roll, pitch, and yaw. So you can actually okay. twist it on its axis. This is your translational control. So just slide to left, slide and right, slide forward, slide back. You really don't have to do a whole lot of this. The big keys are go down faster. Okay. Don't really want to do that. No, not really. And slow down. Okay, is that kind of, so that's essentially, am I controlling the RCS that way, or am I controlling RCS with exactly. both of these? Both. Okay. That's your full control system, some of your thrust descent there. Okay, so this slows it down, mm -hmm. this speeds it up, and it, is it going to be keep, keeping track of fuel consumption? Oh, yes. Well, oh, yes. In other words, I can't, I can only do so much it's, of that it, it before grades, I'm stuck. It grades on a pretty good curve. Yeah. So okay. for now, it's pretty wide acceptance. All right. Uh, so mostly you're going to be, uh, you watch here, so you'll see your glide descent here. You'll be in control once you get down here somewhere uh, for the second time around, and this automatic mode will switch over to main. Okay. Okay, so if you're not sure if you have control or not, you can check that. So how, how far up the lunar surface will I be when I'm in control? Uh, I think it's the last 100 meters or so. Okay. So you'll, you'll see your descent profile. You really want to get this guy down as close to zero as you can. I think it starts up around 10 or 12. Right. Uh, Best advice when you're in control is small inputs. Uh -huh. See what's happening. Right. And then continue on. So the auto flight will give you a good feel for it. Okay. Uh, and the goal is you want to hit home base. Uh -huh. <laughs> but really, what we want to do is land without crashing. So right, right. Uh, and it's possible this guy may flicker on me. I've got a little bit of trouble shooting the one up here. But you ready? Yeah. Okay. It's intimidating so, as hell, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> when, I, when I do the initiate, the stairs will move back, and then this is going to move up and kind of tilt you back a little bit. Okay. And I'll ask if you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. uh, you can give me a thumbs up to the cameras up here. Okay. And then we'll send you on down. You got it. All right. You ready? Yes. Okay. My heart is crawling into my throat. This is really cool. Once again, not landing where the Apollos landed, but on the South Pole near Shackleton Crater. That's where we're going. First time, the experts get to do it. The second time, I need to do it. Okay, let's be honest. You guys don't want to see this thing land safely. You want to see me crash into the moon. So let's skip to the second part. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, let's hit play. Okay, so we're descending, still an automatic, and descending at a frightening rate towards the surface. Oh my dear God. Like I say, I'm still an automatic. I'm relying on the computers currently, but things could get very bad here when I transition to manual control, almost to that point where I'm gonna be going into that mode. Let's see if I can slow down. Slowing down a bit, trying to pitch. Oh my dear God in heaven. I do not even know what I'm doing. Okay, there we go. Let's try to see if we can pitch it. Oh my God, trying to slow down a bit. Nine, eight, good Lord, I'm still descending too fast. Seven, still trying to reduce speed. Six, five meters per second. 
four meters per second. Man, I am really laying on the thrust here trying to slow down. Okay, now trying to straighten up. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Two meters per second. Oh my God, did I just lose? I just lost my visual, there we go. Two meters per second. Wait, no, did I slow down too much there? Slow down, I'm at one meter per second, which may not be the right rate to be descending at. 23 meters, still, okay, still trying to adjust a little bit. 15 meters, ah! <laughs> oh my God. Seven, six, I can't, I keep losing, losing. Also got a bird on that top Display, ah! I, I didn't crash it? You didn't. I thought for sure I was going to crash that. I'm off target. I didn't land in the appropriate landing zone, but close. And I didn't crash the multi-million dollar device. <laughs> How about that? So in terms of overall, I know we talk a lot about the space in here. Is this similar to, to the Halo module in terms of size? It should be about the same diameter. Um, it's not quite as long, uh, but this is a three meter diameter uh, for Alpaca. And it's designed for uh, the Artemis missions in mind. So the requirements of the mission dictated you know, the necessity of where we're landing, the mass constraints, and we're very sensitive to mass, of course. We're always, um, we always have margin. We always close mission. So we always have enough performance and extra performance to get to the extra capability. And we'll talk about the extra capability later. I think Andy's gonna go into that. Right, so I mean, if we are talking about four people um, mm -hmm. landing on the moon for 30 days in, right. in, a, in a habitable space that, yeah, it is spacious compared to Apollo, but right. maybe roughly the size of Sally at six, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, maybe even a little smaller than that. That's you tight. Know, yeah, for four people as opposed to two or three that the Soviets used to put on there. Do you, would you in a perfect world, would you prefer to have a, a habitation? Absolutely. Yeah, facility on the lunar surface in yeah. addition to this for 30 days? Yeah, this later, I call the DR, you know, the design reference mission. The later mission is intended to have a pressurized rover or even a habitat. So the idea is that we are a transport system and carry the crew down. If we need to stay longer, we can. So if we want to go on an exploration mission, say we say base camp is set up, you know, 10 years down there, we have a base camp. It's like, okay, there's something cool we found on Malapert and we want to go uh, do a plane change and take the alpaca over and look at that. So we can bring the crew for a longer term survey expedition. Okay, we don't find what we need. So we don't need to stay there the full time. We can come back to base. So, and then in terms of, of how the mobility of alpaca versus your mass and fuel constraints, mm -hmm. is this thing capable of moving around a bit on the lunar surface without having to refuel? Or are you gonna have to go back up and refuel in lunar orbit before we'll re, you can do it? We'll refuel in NRHO between missions. We wanna make sure we have enough abort capability. We don't wanna go shallow on the tanks, right? So we'll pick a, a landing site that'll be designated. The crew will transfer. We'll proceed down to the landing site, perform the mission. And then once the mission is complete um, and based on the where the gateway is in the NRHO orbit, we'll return to gateway at that point and refuel. Now, some time ago, um, before even any decisions were made on this contract, Dr. Zubrin um, yeah, proposed an idea where Starship brings 100 or 120 tons worth of fuel into lunar orbit, which would allow multiple deployments of alpaca during a single mission. Do you see that as being possible as, as a, as a you know, potential collaboration between the two companies? A propellant depot all opens up a lot of possibilities. So our architecture, um, we do refill propellant in an RHO. So through a depot system, uh, which I won't get into here, but we do refill propellants. So um, we can reuse the lander um, multiple times until we need to basically send it into storage. And that we call that intermission storage. So there's possibility the lander could be recertified, but we have a number of landings we can perform um, with our current architecture and our current refueling. How many reusability reuses? Do you, do you have any idea? We're currently looking at three. The requirement for NASA is one. Right. Right. So we are offering much more reusability than what's required. We're giving, like I said, our our dollar per mission is much cheaper because we are reusable. Right. 
fantastic. Anything else you want to tell me about this space, um, you know, the controls we're looking at, how much of this is going to be automated and how much of this is going to be sure. astronaut controlled? Okay, so you asked me about astronaut. Yes, we do have astronauts on staff, um, former uh, shuttle pilots, uh, a lot of EVA hours um, on our team. And so their input is extremely important and cherished uh, for all that they offer in terms of operational um, expertise, what's comfortable, what's feasible, what isn't, you know, how we sleep at night, you know, what are, what are, the, what are the temperatures that we're most comfortable with, you know, what's, what, what can we tolerate and what can't we tolerate. And um, crew comfort, crew safety is our most important factor here. So um, as for the controls, um, we set the pilot station up as similar to Apollo. In, t in scheme of control. Ideally, um, the landing system is automated, so um, the computer can control with a very, very high fidelity uh, down to a landing target site. We have a, we far exceed the, the landing requirement of 50 meters pinpoint to a landing site. Um, so the crew has uh, authority to take over control at any time, but the nominal mission is an automated landing. So obviously we've got to talk about a lot of other things and we don't have enough time to do it in a video less than 30 minutes long and YouTube isn't going to promote this thing if it's too long. That's just the way of things. But we need to talk about propulsion. We need to actually see a simulation of the area that this lander is going to be setting down in. Take a little roam around and actually check the Shackleton Crater out. But what's really exciting is I got up close and personal with a very important and an enormous component of SLS. Lots of exciting things coming up in part two. So once again, smash that like, hit that subscribe. Please don't forget those notification bells so you won't miss part two. And as always, stay angry about space.